Hi everyone and welcome. I'm Mike Werner and today we're going to be looking at capital budgeting. Capital budgeting is an area that focuses on investing in long-lived expensive assets. These would include land, buildings, equipment, aircraft, manufacturing plants, retail outlets, and even intangible assets such as patents, copyrights, and others. The thing that sets these projects apart from others is that they are expensive and they have a long life. There are four techniques used to evaluate capital projects. The net present value method, NPV, internal rate of return, IRR, payback period, and simple rate of return. Each of the four methods has advantages. Some have a greater number of advantages than others. When evaluating capital projects, a question comes to mind. Should we use operating income or cash flow? Operating income is an accounting measure of performance. It's often used as the basis for performance and financial evaluation. Cash flow is the total cash invested, the operating cash inflows, the operating cash outflows, and the cash flow associated with the sale or disposal of the capital project. For most of us, when we're making an investment, the key consideration is what cash will it generate for us? We can spend cash, we can use cash, but we can't quote unquote use operating income. So when it comes to capital budgeting, generally cash flow is viewed as a much better basis for evaluating capital projects. Operating income is viewed as not as good for evaluating capital expenditures. When we look at cash flows, we should consider cash outflows, such as the initial investment, and perhaps some working capital that might be needed to support the project. Working capital is current assets minus current liabilities, and generally we're talking about the cash, the money required to operate the capital investment. We should also consider any overhauls or special maintenance that would be required. The cash inflows to consider are the annual cash inflows or annual cash savings from the project and the cash inflow upon disposal, if any. When we're making capital budgeting decisions, there are two types of decisions that come to mind. First of all, we have screening decisions. Screening decisions ensure that the project at least meets the company's earning criteria. Preference decisions or ranking decisions help us select the best among various acceptable products. In order to evaluate capital projects, the company has got to establish a required rate of return. And what do companies think about when they do this? Well, first of all, the cash invested in these projects doesn't grow on trees. It doesn't come out of thin air. Instead, the cash comes from two main sources, long-term creditors, where we're borrowing funds, or shareholders, where they have invested in our company as equity stakeholders. Now, these creditors and shareholders expect a return on the cash that they provide. In other words, the capital received from these long-term creditors and shareholders comes at a cost, and we often call this the cost of capital. The cost of capital is the average cost of funding provided by long-term creditors and shareholders. We've got to make sure that whenever we invest in a capital project, the return is high enough to satisfy this cost of capital. Very often then, the required rate of return for capital projects is the cost of capital. In capital budgeting, the required rate of return can go by a number of names. It could be called the cost of capital, the required rate of return, or the RRR, the minimum return, the minimum rate of return, the minimum required rate of return, or it could be called the discount rate. Now, the term discount rate is used to describe the rate used in present value calculations, but since it's the one used to evaluate the projects, oftentimes they refer to the required rate of return as the discount rate. This next area deals with the time value of money. And this has to do with the notion that receiving $10,000 today is more valuable than receiving $10,000 a year from now. If you receive the funds today, you can invest them. Say you can invest it in a savings account for you know, some tiny amount of return these days. It's really small, it's like 1% or less. Sometimes it's even zero. But uh, businesses don't invest for 0% or 1%. They, their, their returns are much higher. They invest in equipment that they can use to earn a substantial return. And so generally, the return that businesses earn and the one that they require for their investments is much higher than you would get in a savings account. So for our purposes, we're going to say oh, the required rate of return for us is 10%. So if we receive $10,000 today, we can invest that, say, in another investment earning 10%. 10% times the 10,000 would give us, uh, let's see, that's $1,000. So let me write this down here. 10,000 uh, 10, times 10% would give us $1,000. 
and then so we have the original uh, 10,000 plus the thousand that would give us at the end of one year eleven thousand dollars so it'd be eleven thousand which is you know a lot better than <laughs> receiving ten thousand today is a lot better than receiving ten thousand a year from now because at ten percent we could take that ten thousand dollars and end up with eleven thousand dollars one year from now and here are the calculations in a more formal fashion so if we look at it here the ten thousand dollars that we started out with plus that same ten thousand dollars at ten percent which would give us one thousand dollars added to the original ten thousand dollars is the eleven thousand dollars we would have one year in the future another way of doing the same thing would be to take the ten thousand dollars times one plus the ten percent or ten thousand dollars times 1.1 would give us the eleven thousand dollars so that's sort of a shortcut way of doing it and if you're not quite following uh, the math uh, don't, don't worry about it. it doesn't matter now if we want to go in the other direction from this future value here what the investment would be one year from now back to the present value at time zero we can do it we can go from the eleven thousand dollars let's say we we know the eleven thousand we'd like to know what it would be worth today based on a 10% rate of return what we can do is take the eleven thousand dollars and divide by one plus the ten percent and so here's the one plus ten percent up here we're multiplying down here what we would do is we would divide now if we do like multiplication better what we can do is instead of dividing by one plus ten percent we can multiply it by one divided by one plus ten percent which would which would give us this factor down here this point nine oh nine oh nine one so what we're doing here is in the top part we're going from the present value to the future value so we're calculating future value of the ten thousand dollars for one year at ten percent down here what we're doing is we're starting with the eleven thousand dollars and working this way back towards the present value so we can take the eleven thousand times this factor of 0 0.909091 and multiply to get back to present value so we're sort of calculating the present value and wow what a pain to calculate this 1.1 up here this factor up here and then this down here this 0 0.909091 I mean you might follow it in the video but uh, two minutes after you're done watching the video you're, you're gonna forget all about this so wouldn't it be nice if these you know if these factors were provided well lo and behold they are provided they are provided for this future value factor we can look at a table here's the table which is the future value of a dollar table and the idea is it gives us all these factors for one dollar and then if we're you know if we've got ten thousand dollars we just multiply it by the, this factor by by the ten thousand dollars so the future value of one dollar table and we look uh, for one year look across here one year at the ten percent column and there it is the 1.1 so this 1.1 factor that we need we can get it from this future value of a dollar table now this particular table I just printed out uh, actually I, I, I created it on Microsoft Excel and then I just printed it out I carried this out to four decimal places you could carry it out for more decimal places or fewer decimal places and in most accounting textbooks managerial accounting uh, financial accounting intermediate account in most accounting textbooks they have a sampling of these tables I say a sampling because they only give you enough tables to do the calculations that are included in the homework in the textbook to be uh, tables that you could use in business oh my god it would be a book of tables that was you know as thick as the dictionary in the lobby of the library it'd have to be really really thick because these these interest rates you know six percent seven percent eight percent you know how, like banks they, they have rates like you know four in a quarter percent and they, these are annual rates they, their rates are oftentimes monthly so you can imagine how many different variations there are of the rates and then also I'm only going up to 25 periods here 25 years um, if, if you get a car loan that that's 60 periods so this table would not work so they're good for academic purposes just like the ones in your textbooks they're only good for academic purposes really okay but what about that one so to go in this direction or towards present value what we'll do is we'll look at the present value of a dollar table 
very much like the future value of a dollar table, but this is the present value of a dollar. And this is for one dollar, so if we're dealing with, say, $11,000, we've got to multiply this factor, whichever factor we select, by the $11,000. So we, one year here, one year I've indicated, I'm going across, and then at 10%, the factor is right there, 0 0.9091, which is, let's take, go back and look, yep, there it is. 909091. Now, now I rounded my table to four decimal places, and this is rounded obviously to more decimal places. More decimal places is more accurate, but for our purposes here, I think the four decimal places would be plenty. So anyway, we would take the eleven thousand dollars times this factor, 0 0.909091, and when we multiply, we would find out that the eleven thousand dollars a year from now has a present value of $10,000 today. Now what that means is we could use this table for other years too. Let's let's say that you know we're going to get the $11,000 5 years from now. Well, 5 years from now, $11,000, let's follow across at 10% 0 0.6209. So we'd multiply the $11,000 by 0 0.6209 and that would give us the present value of $11,000 received in 5 years at 10%. Next thing I'd like to talk about are annuities, an annuity or annuities. An annuity is a stream of equal cash flows, and there's an equal time interval between each cash flow. And, and you've heard of these before. I mean, you may be dealing with some of these or one of these now, such as car payments, home mortgage payments, monthly rental payments on apartment or warehouse or what have you monthly rent received and there are many many others so anytime we have a situation where we have an equal amount of cash coming in or going out and there's an equal time span between each one of these payments technically it's called an annuity very often in capital investment decisions we think of the cash flows coming in every year as an annuity for example let's say with our eleven thousand dollars instead of getting an eleven thousand dollar payment one year from now and that's it we're going to get an $11,000 payment each and every year for the next five years. For capital budgeting purposes, generally cash flows are assumed to take place at the end of each period. This may not be entirely realistic, but it's close enough for evaluating capital projects. An exception to this might be if we're evaluating a project where we're going to have rental income. In that case, the rental income may be you know, received at the beginning of each period. But by and large, when we do capital budgeting calculations, unless there's some evidence or statement to the contrary, we assume that the cash flows take place at the end of each period. Now for us, the cash flow is going to take place at the end of each of the next five years, and we're going to get $11,000 per year. So I've drawn this out, and this is pretty popular to do when you're talking about capital projects that are going to last a long time. We've got today, which we call time zero, and then the year one, year two, year three, year four, year five. So we've got all the years. And we see that we're going to get a cash inflow of $11,000 per year. The question is, the question is, the big question is, what's its present value? What's the present value of all of that? Well, we can, we can figure this out. Uh, first of all, we need an interest rate. So the rate we're going to use is the 10%. And now what we're going to do is bring each one of these back to present value, back to present value, bring each one of these back to present value individually using that present value of a dollar table. There we go. So bring them all back. So we'll take the $11,000 times the, uh, what was it, 0.9091 to get the $10,000 for year one. And then for year two, we'll take 11000 and we'll go to our table. Where's that, where's that present value table I had a minute ago? Here it is. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a fact. Point um, eight six eight two six four eight two six four point point eight two six four. So I'll multiply that, and then eleven thousand times. Let me get the table again. Table again. Seven five one three. Seven five one three. Multiply that out. You know. So multiply that. And the next one is uh, point six eight three zero. 11,000 times 0 0.6830, multiply that, and then uh, what else do we have? Uh, and the fifth one is 0 0.6209, so 11,000 times 0 0.6209, so do all this multiplication, and then I'll, 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 I'll do the multiplication, I'll add them all up, and I'll get the total here, and that will be the present value, so I, I can actually do this, I can do this with no problem. 
So in a more you know formal fashion here, let's take a look. I brought back the eleven thousand dollars to present value. There we go. And, and you could you could uh, use present value tables maybe in your textbook uh, or some other source and. Uh, you can go ahead and do these calculations yourself. You can do them yourself. As a matter of fact, let me put this back up on the screen for a moment. And you can, uh, you know, do a screen capture and maybe print that out and use that as we're doing these calculations. Use this uh, table as we're doing the calculations. It'd probably be handy to have. So anyway, looking at the table, we can go ahead and, and, and get all of our factors. Here they are. I've, I've highlighted them. I've highlighted them all in, in yellow, in yellow. And so we're going to get each one of those and enter it on the, in the calculation. So here it is. Here it is. I, I, I've, I've done it, done them all and multiplied them all. 11,000 times, you know, 0 0.9, $11,000 point eight times 0 0.82, $11,000 times 0 0.75, $11,000 dollars 0.68, $11,000, you know, I kept on multiplying across. I got tired of doing it. And then once I did it, though, I could add down and get my total present value. There it is, the magic number, the present value for uh, $11,000 received at the end of each year for the next five years at 10%. So I was able to do this using the present value table. Now, uh, some of you are good at math, and I was never that good at math, but some of the, you that are good at math, you, you recognized that by applying math axioms, this is not the best way to do this. This is the, not so efficient because I'm multiplying, 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 then adding. Since I'm multiplying everything by the 11,000, I could have just added the factors and multiplied once. Here that is, here that is. I could have just looked up all my factors, looked them all up, made a notation, and then multiplied one time to get the final answer. Final answer is exactly the same. And that is a little more efficient. But still, what a pain. What a pain this is. you got to look up all these factors. What a time-consuming pain in the neck. Then you've got to add them all up. Wouldn't it be nice if instead of having to look all these up and then add them up, wouldn't it be nice if we could just get this, this factor right here, if we could get this number right here, you know, somewhere. Lo and behold, we have a table for annuities. The present value of an annuity of a dollar table. Present value of an annuity of a dollar table. Now, and this is an ordinary annuity. This is when the payments are received at the end of each period. If it was a present value table where the payments received at the beginning of each pay, uh, period, this would work. And, and you'd want to look at the present value of what they call an annuity due table. An annuity due table. An annuity due table is a present value table where the payments re are received at the beginning of each period. But in our case, we get the payments coming at the end, and, and this is the right table. And so we follow across five years, follow on across to 10% column. There it is, 3.5. 7908 7908 and you'll recall what we calculated before when we added the present value factors off the present value of a dollar table they totaled 3.7907 this totals 3.7908 and that's just because of the rounding taking place i rounded this table when i prepared it in microsoft excel to four decimal places you know, making it, you know, somewhat accurate, but not totally accurate. You know, I figured it would be good enough, but there is some rounding that comes into play when you round your present value table. And in textbooks, they will either use, say, four decimal places, or very often, they will use only three decimal places in these tables. So anyway, there's our factor. And we're going to use this one to calculate the present value. So instead of doing all that other work, we could have simply done this. $11,000 times the factor we just found, 3.7908 gives us a present value of 4,698.80. So we've got the present value of this stream of cash flows. Quite nice. Quite quickly done. So the idea is that at 10% rate of return, the 41,698.80 is equivalent to receiving $11,000 a year for the next five years. Again, at 10%. Now, I've got another question. What if instead of a situation where we're going to receive these $11,000 cash payments and how much is it worth today, what if instead we were investing $11,000 per year 
$11,000 at the end of each year for the next five years, how much would it be worth? Remember, we did this problem for one year. The factor at 10% was 1.1. But how about for five years, five years? Here's what we're trying to figure out. If we invest, if we invest $11,000 a year at the end of each of the next five years, how much will we have at the end of that fifth year? How much will it be? And you can't just add these up and, you know, and, or take 11,000 multiply by five because you're going to be earning 10% per year and it's going to be compounded annually, compounded annually. So it's not that simple. Instead, what we do, since this is an annuity, we use the future value of an annuity table. So future value of an annuity table. You may want to take a, a, a screenshot or a picture of this one also. We're probably not going to use much in the way of the future value tables uh, for the rest of this presentation, but you know it might be nice to have. Anyway, five years, following across to the 10% column, it's 6.1051. There's our 6.1051, and we're multiplying it by our $11,000. So if we invest $11,000 a year for each of the next five years at 10% return, we should end up with $67,156.10 using our future value tables. Well, you know these future value tables are great, but there is a better and more modern way, and that's to use a financial calculator. Instead of using these tables, the present value of a dollar table, the present value of an annuity of a dollar table, the future value of a dollar table, and the future value of an annuity of a dollar table. Instead of using these tables, we can instead use a calculator. Now, the thing about the tables, you might say, well, the tables work fine. Well, for these academic problems, they work fine. But if you were going to use present value and future value tables and work for work, you would have to have a book of tables. I mean, it's got to be huge because banks don't use just interest rates of, say, 5% on that home mortgage. It's 5% divided by 12 months. And then it's not even 5%, it's five and a quarter percent. And so you'd have to have tables that accommodate all of these different interest rates. And this only goes up to 25 periods. If, if, if you have a home mortgage, you're talking about 360 periods. A car loan, a five-year car loan is 60 periods. I mean, this, this table would not work. None of the tables in any of your textbooks would be adequate. You'd have to have a huge, thick book of tables. Consequently, nowadays, nobody uses them. Nobody uses them. We use them in school. You, you have to use them in school. And believe it or not, they're used on the CPA exam, but they are not used in business. They are simply not. And instead, we use calculators. Here are the two of the most popular calculators for use in, in school. You've got the, the Texas Instrument BA2+. Plus. You've got the Hewlett Packard 10B, both very good calculators. The Business Analyst 2 Plus, you can buy these things for as little as $25 and as high as maybe $35. The reason they're so popular among students is they're very affordable, and the way you use them to add and subtract is very similar to the addition and subtraction that you do on a regular calculator. Now, notice these calculators have a bunch of buttons. Don't just run out and buy a calculator with a bunch of buttons. It must include these keys here. You see N, I, P, V, P, M, T, and F, V. Here they are up here. N, I, P, V, P, M, T, and F, V. That's what sets it apart from a regular calculator. You know, the little cheapy calculators you can get for $12. These cost at minimum $25. You can get this one for about the same price. And then this is also a very popular calculator. This one is less popular among students, but very popular among financial professionals. And the reason it's popular is, uh, number one, it's very robust. It, it, it's very dependable. And, and secondly, the keystroke pattern when you're adding and subtracting is very much like a 10-key adding machine you might see on an accountant's desk or a financial professional's desk. So the keystroke pattern, in other words, uh, when you're adding with, with a calculator, with a, you know, say, say that you've got one of these calculators here, you know, when you're adding, this this happens to be a brand new BA2+. Plus. But what you do is when you're adding, you, you, you tell it what you want to do first, plus four. And if you want to subtract two from that, you, you enter minus two, okay? Uh, where on this type of calculator, and here's a brand new one of these in the box. But let me, let me get this one, this one here. Here's one, same one, different color. What happens with this one is you want to do five plus five. That's your starting point. You put the number in, five, enter. Now you've got your starting point. And now you want to add two to that. 
2, and then you hit the plus, and you want to hit subtract 3 from that, 3, then you hit the minus, very much like a 10 key adding machine used in business. So this calculator has the same keystroke pattern, so it's very popular among financial professionals. But if a student buys one, it takes them a, you know, a few minutes to become accustomed to adding and subtracting with it. Otherwise, it's got those functions right here, N, I, P, V, P, M, T, and F, E, great calculator. You can also use a programmable calculator. Here's a number of them, TI-84+, plus, the Inspire CX, and what happens with these is they've got programs embedded in them or that you can buy for them where you've got the financial functions available. These uh, work okay. I don't like them as much because you've got to pull up the function and fill everything in that way. Also, for some of these calculators, if you're going to try to use this in school, the professor more than likely will not allow you to use at least some of these, especially this one in the middle, for exam purposes, because you can also enter notes and other notations in the calculator. So these work. They're, they're fine, and you may have one, but definitely the financial calculators are probably the better way to go. One other comment is you can get apps for your phone for the Hewlett Packard 12C and for the Business Analyst 2 Plus. You can get this app directly from Texas Instrument. It, it costs a little less than $15, but uh, if you buy that from Texas Instrument, you turn your phone into this calculator. Well, let's take a look at this situation again. This is our situation where we're getting $11,000 a year for each of the next five years, and we figured out the present value of that is $41,698.80. Now, let me ask you a question. If you want a 10% return, and you've done this calculation and figured out that at 10%, the present value is $41,698.80, if you were considering a machine that cost $45,000, would you invest? And most of you are saying, well, no, because $45,000 is more than the present value of this stream of cash flows. So here it is. Yeah, if we hit the required investment of $45,000 against the cash flows brought back to present value at 10%, we see that the present value is less than the required investment. And it's less than the required investment by 3,301.20. So more than likely, we would not want to make this investment. Now, this amount that we've calculated here is called the net present value. Let's talk more about this. The net present value is one of the most popular and well-respected models for evaluating capital projects. And the net present value equals the present value of the cash inflows minus the present value of the cash outflows associated with the capital project. It's important to note that the net present value is different from present value. Present value is looking at the present value of a particular stream of cash flows. It does not net out the inflows and the outflows. The net present value, on the other hand, does net out the inflows and the outflows. It considers both inflows and outflows. Now, once we calculate the net present value, how do we interpret it? Well, if the net present value is positive, that means that the project's return exceeds our required rate of return. On the other hand, if the net present value is negative, that means that the return on the project is less than our required rate of return. Now, if we happen to calculate the net present value and magically it's zero, if we've come up with a zero net present value, what that means is that the actual return on the project is the rate of return that we used in the net present value calculations. So let's say, for example, we do the net present value calculations and we use 13%. And lo and behold, the net present value of the project comes out to be zero. That means that the actual return on the project is the 13% we used when we did the net present value calculations. Another thing that's noteworthy about this is that if you want to determine the net present value of a project, in theory, you could do the net present value calculation over and over again using various interest rates. And when you happen upon a particular interest rate where the net present value is zero, you will have determined the actual return on the project. And as you'll see in a few minutes, that actual return on the project is often called the internal rate of return or the IRR for the project. So now let's take a look at calculating the net present value. And here it is. You've got the required investment to 45000 already at present value because we'd be making the investment today. And then you've got the present value of this stream of cash flows. And there's a negative net present value. Net present value. Or the net present value is a negative 3,301.20.
Now you can calculate net present value using a calculator as well. Here's our $45,000 outflow and we get our calculator, get our calculator. Let me, let me grab one here. Okay. So I've got my calculator here and you'll notice, you'll notice that I've got the same keys N I P V P M T N F E as what I've got here. Same keys. So I'm going to do just what it says here. I'm going to take five and put five and then hit N. So N is the number of periods. I is the I stands for interest rate. So I'm going to go ahead and put uh, 10 to the interest rate. And then PV is what I want to find out. So I'm not going to put anything in there. Just leave it blank for now. Move on to the PMT, which is the amount of the annuity or the payments, 11,000. Put that into payment. And now the future value is a one-time cash flow at the end of the investment. In this case, we don't have any one-time cash flow, so I'm going to put zero. There we go. And now I'm going to ask the calculator for present value. On this calculator, the 12C, all I've got to do is hit the key, PV. There we go. And what does it say? It says 41,698.65. You see there? 48,698.65. And you'll notice that the amount calculated with our calculator is just, it's like 15 cents off of what we got when we use the table. Why is that? Because the factor we use, 3.7908, it is rounded to four decimal places. If it went on like for 12 decimal places, the answers would be exactly the same. Your calculator doesn't round the factors, but the tables do. So the calculator gives you a more precise answer. I'm going to go ahead and go with this uh, answer we got from the tables, but you can see that there is a, a little bit of a, a difference. One other thing to note is the $11,000 I entered as a positive number, but the, the present value I got from the calculator is a negative amount, is a negative amount. And why is that? Well, the calculator is programmed so that basically the present value total of these three registers, the present value, the payments, and the future value, they together need to equal zero. So if you're putting positive amounts for the payment and the future value, the present value is going to be a negative. Conversely, if I had entered this uh, payment as 11,000 negative, I would have gotten a positive figure here. Now, what this is really telling me is that at 10%, in order to earn $11,000 a year for five years, I would have to pay out or invest, have an outflow, a negative number of 41,698.65. So the investment I would have to make today to earn 10% is a negative amount and a cash outflow to earn this $11,000 a year for five years and inflow. Well, in any case, here we are working with this potential investment and the question is, if our required rate of return or cost of capital is 10%, would we make the investment? And you see here, the net present value is a negative amount. And therefore, the return on the project is less than the 10% and we would not invest. Well, now let's change things up a little bit. Now let's assume that we've just found out the equipment has a residual value of $7,000. So at the end of the fifth year, we are going to get a cash inflow of $7,000. So not only will we get the $11,000, we're also going to get this $7,000. So how do we figure out the new net present value of this equipment factoring in this additional cash flow? Well, it turns out it's not that difficult. What we can do is look at the present value of a dollar table and multiply this $7,000 by the present value of $1 for five years at 10%. So we look at our present value of a dollar table, not the present value of an annuity table. It's a one-time cash flow at the end. Five years, follow it across here, five years. At 10%, it's 0 0.6209 is the factor. That's the factor that we would use. So we're going to multiply the $7,000 by this 0 0.6209. And that $7,000 payment received five years from now has a present value of 4,346.30. And so now if we sum all of these, all of these, we get 45,000 outflow, the present value of the cash inflow uh, from operating the machine, which is uh, 41,698.80. And then the present value, the residual value we're going to get when we sell the machine at the end of its useful life gives us a positive net present value of $1,045.10.
So what this means is the return on this project exceeds 10%. We could have also done the same calculation on our calculator. We've already done this one up here, so we did that a minute ago. And then for this bottom one, all we've got to do, let's see if I can get this calculator up here, uh, five years. Five years is already in there, and the interest rate's already in there. The payment, I'm going to change that to zero, and, it, and now put $7,000 in, enter $7,000 as the future value, and that will give me a present value of $4,346.45. 4,346.45, a little different, a little different because of the rounding of the factor, but still it's, it's quite close. So you can use your calculator to get the same answer. And you might be noticing that using the calculator is a lot quicker, a lot easier. Well, let's take using the calculator one more step towards ease of operation. And here's what I mean. What I can do is enter the $11,000 as the payment, the $7,000 as the future value. And I've already entered the five years in the 10% 10, 10 here. So just ask for the present value. And there we go, 4605.10, 4605.10. Now, if you add these two together, add the 41 and the 4,300 something, you get $46,045.10. In this case, it happens to be exactly the same amount that we get in our calculator. So somehow the rounding has counterbalanced itself, but there you go. And so in one calculation, one calculation, you can determine the present value of the future cash flows in your calculator. And then all you've got to do is subtract that amount or from the 45,000 to get your net present value of $1,045.10. Now I've gone ahead and calculated the net present value for several projects. We don't have just one project, we have several. Now here, here's our project right here, here it is. This is it, project B is our project. And I wanna select a project that's a real winner. And we, we notice that all of these projects have positive net present values. There's our $1,045.10 for project B. Really like this project, but now I'm trying to rank projects and, 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 and select which one would be the best. I've already screened them and all of these have an acceptable net present value. So which one should I take? We have 900, 1,045, 1,100, or 1,200. Well, the one with the highest net present value is this one, Project B. So we've got the net present value, and we want to select this, this project here, Project D, because it's got the highest uh, net present value. But there's a flaw in this ranking. This ranking fails to consider the relative amount invested in each one of these projects compared to the net present value. So to rank the projects, we really shouldn't use the net present value, but instead we should use something called the profitability index, a very simple model. The profitability index uses the net present value of competing projects and takes the project's investment into account. So here are our projects again. In the profitability index, very simple calculation is the net present value of the project divided by the required investment. So you see here for, for our project, it's got the net present value of 1,045.10. The required investment, as you recall, is $45,000. It gives us an index of 0 0.0232. And then if we do the same calculation for the other ones, we've got uh, 0 0.0214, 0 0.0220, 0 0.0214. They're all kind of close, as, as you might expect, because we're evaluating projects of similar risk levels and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, uh, this one, this one's definitely the highest. So we select the project with the highest profitability index. Project B is ranked highest. So our project turns out is the best project when ranked using the profitability index. So you don't want to rank your projects by their NPV. Instead, take that NPV, calculate a profitability index for each one of them, and rank them by the profitability index. So just to recap, we've been working on the net present value model. And let me tell you, this model is very well respected, very well respected. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Number one, it's based on cash flows, which is the preferred way of evaluating capital projects. And secondly, and very importantly, it considers the time value of money. This is critically important. And it also, it, it, with respect to uh, determining the rate of return on the project, it does not determine the rate of return on the project, but at least it lets us know whether or not our project 
meets the required rate of return. So the green marking here is not quite as dark, but still it does a fairly good job. Uh, the reinvestment rate on these projects, we haven't talked about this at all, but mathematically the net present value model assumes that funds received would be reinvested at the net present value rate, the rate that we use to calculate the net present value. And since we generally use the cost of capital, it's pretty realistic to assume that we could reinvest those funds at that required rate of return or that cost of capital amount. So it's pretty realistic. Another uh, dark green square here for the net present value model. And then here's one that's uh, it's still green, but not quite as dark green. And, and it has to do with ranking projects. And what it says here is the NPV itself cannot be used to rank projects, but it's got a green square, light green square at least, because all we've got to do is calculate the profitability index, and then we can use it to rank projects. Really nice. All greens, all green lights, all green lights. Um, it's, it's very, very well respected. A moment ago, I was talking about the NPV helping us to determine the return on a project. And, and we know this is this has got a it's it's a higher rate of return than the 10 percent that we require but how much more is it is it a lot more a tiny bit more a, a medium amount more i mean and when we look at this 11 the one thousand dollars one thousand forty five dollars compared to these other amounts the return is higher than 10 percent but not by a huge amount like it's probably not going to be like 20 percent or anything like that and boy i would really like to know what the return is on this project wouldn't you got it it's done we got it the return on the project is 10.8427%. Very precise, very precise. How did I get that? Did I get it using the tables? Nope, can't use the tables for this one very easily because you have differing cash flows. Here's what I did. I went ahead, I've got the five in the calculator already. Remember, this is how we left our calculator. Let me just re-enter all this information again. So we've got uh, five years, five years, good. The interest rate is what I'm trying to figure out, so I don't, I don't want to enter anything for that. The investment required is $45,000. $45,000. Let me put that in there. And then the cash inflow is going to be $11,000 per year for five years. So I'll put that in as the, the annuity or the payments. So I got that there. And then the future value is $7,000. Put that in. Put that in there. And now I'm going to ask for the interest rate. Let's see what it says. Wish me luck. I need it. Oh my God. Look at look at that. Error five. Error five. A very popular error. When I see that, what it tells me is I put all of these numbers in in the same direction. They're all in the same direction. And remember, they've got to sort of mathematically inside at present value add up to zero. So I forgot when I put the forty-five thousand dollars into the calculator. I should have changed its sign to a negative. Make it a negative number. Let me put that in as the present value. Now I ask my calculator for the interest rate. It's running. It takes a little while to do it because it, it, it uses actually trial and error to, to determine this. Um, and uh, running many, many, many you know net present value calculations till it comes up with one that uses an interest rate where the present value is zero. Anyway, here it is, 10.8427 percent and there we go 10.8427 10 percent and you see on this calculator it took just a moment to do and I was able to do this even though I had differing cash flows and that I had a residual value at the end of the assets useful life now what if every period results in a different cash flow it's usually not such a big problem for a calculator like this or a calculator like this one either because for these calculators, you are able to enter up to like 20 some differing cash flows period to period in these calculators. I'm not going to show you how to do it. It's sort of beyond what we're doing here today. It would take a while to do, but you can do it if you need to. Now for these calculators, very quickly and easily, just these basic keys, just the, you know, the, the keys that we're using, you can enter, enter payments as one amount and then a, a future value uh, for the uh, residual as another amount and still easily calculate the uh, rate of return on the project, the actual rate of return on the project. Now this actual rate of return on the project goes by a different name. It's often called the internal rate of return. The internal rate of return, it's the actual re rate of return on the project, the actual rate of return expected to achieve on any project. 
And so we are able to calculate that using a financial calculator. And to an extent, you can calculate it using present value tables. So let's talk about that for, for a moment. Let's assume that we have this potential capital project. And this is one with an, an initial outflow, an initial investment of $47,000. So we're switching to another project. $47,000. The cash inflows per year for five years is $12,716.79. $12,716.79 per year for the next five years. Pretty precise, pretty precise number, wouldn't you say? So anyway, how are we going to be able to get the rate of return on this project, the internal rate of return on this project, using tables? Well, you'll recall that when we use the tables, what we did is we looked up the number of years and the rate, and we came up with a factor. There's our factor. See it right there? But when we're trying to determine the rate of return, what we do is we use the table in reverse. We, we take our numbers and determine the present value factor. And then we look at, say, five years, the life of our project. We try to find a number that's close to our factor. And once we find one, we follow that up to get the interest rate. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to use the table backwards. So to get our factor, it's very simple. What we do is take the required investment and divide it by the annual cash flows, which is 12,1679. And we get a present value factor that we're going to try to find on our table of 3.6959. Crazy number, right? 3.6959. So let's go ahead and, and try to find this on our table. Okay, follow it across. Five years, five years. We're following across here. Here we go. Uh, I don't see it. I don't see it. Oh, oh yeah, look here. 3.6959. It's exactly our factor. Well, it's a little bit contrived here for demonstration purposes. That's why the, the cash flows each year was such a crazy number. So I could come up with exactly one of these. And now what I'm going to do is follow this up and we find out we're in the 11% column. So the return on this project is exactly 11%. Now, very often, the factor that you determine is between, you know, the two of these numbers. And then you just sort of have to guesstimate. There's another technique called interpolation. But I got to tell you, I don't spend much time on this because most of us are not going to be doing this. Most of us are going to be using what? Our financial calculators that you're going out to buy right away. You're going to go on Amazon and get that Texas Instrument BA2 Plus for $25. Amazon Prime, you'll have it in two days. Okay, so now let's go ahead and calculate the 11%, but this time let's use a calculator. So I've got the, the Texas Instrument calculator out this time. We get a uh, five-year project, so let me put that in there. Five. There we go. Five years. Good. And then uh, $47,000 per year. $47,000 per year. And i uh, got to change the sign with this key right here. I don't know if you can see it right there. Change the sign to a negative. Put that in as the present value. Good. And now I'm going to put in the 12,716.79 as an inflow, so a positive number. Put it in a PMT. Zero for the future value. And now let me get the interest rate. Now, you would think I could just hit I like I can on the 12C, but I can't. I've got to tell it to compute it. So I'll go up here to CPT, Compute. Push that key, and then I, and there it is. There's our 11%. There's our 11%. So very easily done on a calculator. Easier than the uh, tables, right? Let's change it up just slightly. Now, let's say this piece of equipment we find out has a residual value of $5,000 at the end of the last year. Well, can we use that formula where we try to find the factor and so on and so forth? And the answer to that question is no. That will not work. We would have to use trial and error over and over again with the tables until we determined an interest rate that would result in a net present value of zero. And that's how we would determine the internal rate of return. What a load of work. So instead, what we're going to do is use our calculator again. Here it is. And this time, we've got, we've got you know, the 5 in here, and we've got the... The 47,000 there, we've got the 12,716.79 in, in, the, in the payments. Now let's just put, all we need to do is put the uh, $5,000 in this register in the future value. 5,000. I'm going to hit uh, future value. And now I'm going to compute the interest rate again. Compute interest rate. And there it is, 
13.337. There we are. That's how we do it. So 5 and N. The interest rate is what we're trying to find out. Then we uh, we get the 47,000. We enter that. We get the uh, 12,716. We enter that as a payment. 5,000 into the future value. And we ask the calculator for the interest rate. And it provides us with 13.3673%. The same as what we've got there on our Texas Instrument BA2 Plus calculator. So easy, so quick. So what we've been doing is calculating the internal rate of return. The internal rate of return, sometimes called the IRR. And uh, let's talk about this model a little bit. It's very well respected, just like the NPV model. It's very well respected. And the reason it's well respected is, number one, it's based on cash flows. And number two, another huge consideration is that it considers the time value of money. That's huge for these capital projects because the cash flows will take place over a very extended period of time, many years. It also not only provides us with a, a, an idea of the rate of return on a project, it provides us with the exact rate of return on the project. So that's, that's great. And then um, what about the reinvestment rate? Well, mathematically, mathematically, the internal rate of return model assumes reinvestment at the internal rate of return. It assumes that we will reinvest the cash flows at the internal rate of return. This may be possible. Companies might be able to invest at the internal rate of return, but maybe not. It could be that we have a project that has a significantly high internal rate of return compared to our cost of capital. Most of our projects pay a return, uh, provide a return down near our cost of capital. And yet we have this project that you know has a high rate of return it would assume that we can find more projects with that high rate of return to reinvest those funds. So this is a little bit of a problem with the internal rate of return model. And uh, so I'm going to give it a very light yellow uh, box here. It's not, not a huge amount of caution, but at least something to be uh, aware of. And then the ability to rank projects, a solid green light here, because you can use the internal rate of return to rank the projects. You can compare one internal rate of return to the other and rank the projects effectively. So in comparing the two methods, the net present value model and the internal rate of return model, they're both excellent. They're both widely used. Sometimes they're used even together. Uh, the net present value model sort of edges out the internal rate of return model, I guess because it provides a dollar amount, which is you know sometimes viewed as useful. And then secondly, it assumes reinvestment at the cost of capital the rate used to calculate the net present value instead of reinvestment at the project's rate of return. So now let's move on to the payback period. These next two models do not consider the time value of money. The, the two that we're talking about are the payback period and the simple rate of return, sometimes called the accounting rate of return and also sometimes called the accrual accounting rate of return. So these are worth mentioning because they are used but they're not nearly as well respected. Why? Because they do not consider the time value of money. And for long-term projects where you're going to get the cash flows far into the future, the time value of money is critically important to consider. Well, what is the payback period? <laughs> as you might imagine, it's the amount of time it's going to take to recoup our investment or have the investment pay back the original cash investment in the project. For example, let's say that we've got a project that has a $47,000 investment required today and promises $12,716.79 each year for five years. No residual value. So what is the payback period? Well, obviously, you just take the $47,000, divide by $12,716.79, it's going to take 3.6959 years to recoup that investment. So the payback period is about 3.7 years, 3.7 years. Now, what if we've got an investment with differing cash flows? You see, these cash flows are equal. What if the cash flows differ? Well, here we've got a project requires a $50,000 investment. The residual value is $5,000. And the annual cash flows from the operation of this asset are $8,000, $15,000, $21,000, $15,000, and $9,000 in the fifth year. So you see the cash flow differs from one year to the next. In the last year, we not only have the cash inflow from the operation, but we also have the residual value coming in at $5,000 for a total of $14,000. So how do we determine the payback period? 
not so difficult to do. What we do is create a table, and in the table we've got the first column is just an indication of the years. Then we've got uh, the investment required, which I've just repeated here for you know just so that we we're aware of it. And then the cash inflow each year. I list the cash inflow each year, and you'll notice in the last year I'm using the fourteen thousand dollars after we recoup the residual value. And then I've got I've got another column for the collection to date. The collection to date. So eight thousand dollars. At the end of the first year, we collect uh, 8000 so we're up to 8000 and, and another column is the unrecovered investment, which at the end of the first year is 42000 And then for the second year, we've got a cash inflow of 15000 Total uh, collected due date is 23000 The 23000 from the 50000 is 27000 And then uh, moving on to the next year, we've got 50000 as the investment, uh, 21000 collected in, in this third year. We're up to $44,000. We haven't collected all of it yet. We're only $6,000 away. Uncollected amount is $6,000. Then the next year, we, we collect $15,000. Oh boy, if we collect $15,000, we not only collect the $6,000 we need, but we collect more. We collect quite a bit more. And so the collection to date at the end of this fourth year would be $59,000. So what we find, it's going to take three plus years, three plus years, the third year, and then we've only got $6,000 more. So we're going to need some of the fourth year, but not all of it. So how much is that? How much time is that? Three years plus 6,000 over 15,000, which is 0.4 to give us a payback period of 3.4 years. Taking a look at the payback period and how it measures up. Here's the payback period column. First of all, it's not well respected. It is based on cash flows, yeah, sure enough, but it does not consider the time value of money. This is huge. This is huge. I, maybe I, sh I should have put a red block here instead of the caution yellow, right? It's a problem. And then another problem with it is it doesn't really provide us with any indication of the project's rate of return. It just tells us how long it will take to recoup the funds. The reinvestment rate, not applicable because it doesn't give us any rate of return. Uh, now, one good thing about it is it can be used to rank projects. It can be used to rank projects. So the two good things, it's based on cash flow, and it can be used to rank projects. You know, a project that will take three years to recoup your investment uh, probably is viewed better than one that will take four. It's not well respected, but can be used for rough screening of projects and also could be used in conjunction with these other models, in conjunction with these other models. Whatever you do, don't walk into the conference room to meet with everybody in the company and you, the only thing you have in your pocket is the payback period. Oh my God, it's gonna be embarrassing. It's not well respected. So now let's move on to the last model we're gonna look at, which is called the simple rate of return, sometimes called the accounting rate of return, and sometimes called the accrual accounting rate of return. The simple rate of return, sometimes called the accounting rate of return, is a rate of return based on accounting operating income instead of cash flows. It's viewed as weaker than an NPR or IRR because it is not based on cash flows, number one, and number two, it does not consider the time value of money. So it's got two huge strikes against it. But it does have some benefits. You know, why are we even looking at it? Well, at least it provides some measure of the project's rate of return. I say some and I italicize some because the rate of return is not a time adjusted rate of return. It does not take into account the time value of money, which is an issue. So uh, it does provide us with some rate of return, but it's, it's not the best rate of return to look at. Another thing about it, another positive aspect, is it's, it, it, it uses accounting income. And remember, accounting income is what is often used to evaluate a company or to evaluate a segment of a company or to evaluate a manager's uh, performance within that company. So it does look at accounting income, which is often used to evaluate performance in general. So it does have that as a redeeming quality. So to calculate the simple rate of return, what we can do is simply take the incremental cash flows, incremental cash inflows from the project that we've been using for all of our other models, subtract depreciation, and then divide it by the initial investment. Now, sometimes instead of calculating the simple rate of return using the initial investment, some companies and some analysts prefer to use the average investment, which is not too difficult to get. All you've got to do is, here's a little example. We've got the initial investment of 19000 residual value of 1000 
how do we calculate the average investment? Well, at the beginning of the project's life, it's 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 got a cost of nineteen thousand. At the end of the project's life, it's got a, a residual value of a thousand. Add those together, we and divide by two. So we're going to add them together. We get twenty thousand. Divide by two, we get an average investment of ten thousand dollars. So obviously, when we're using the average investment, the rate of return is considerably higher. But if we use average investment for all of our calculations, it works out fine. Now, for our calculations, we're going to go ahead and use the initial investment instead of the average investment. So here, back to our project, that's $47,000 with the annual cash flows of $12,716.79 and a residual value of $5,000. And so what we're going to need to do is we've got the cash inflows here. What we've got to do is take this amount, subtract the depreciation. So we must calculate the depreciation. And as you'll recall from your financial accounting class, or maybe you're not aware of this, but straight line depreciation equals the cost of the asset minus the residual value divided by the estimated useful life. And in this case, it's $47,000 minus the $5,000 divided by five years, it's $8,400 per year. So what we're gonna do is take the 12,716, the annual cash flows, and we are going to subtract the $8,400, the straight line depreciation, and we're going to divide it by the investment, or you could use average investment if you like, and we arrive at a return rate of 9.18. That is, we've got a simple rate of return of 9.18. Again, sometimes called the accounting rate of return, and sometimes called the accrual accounting rate of return. A fairly simple calculation to do. Okay, so now let's take a look at the, the benefits of using this uh, simple rate of return. First of all, it's not well respected for capital budgeting. Why is it not well respected? Well, it's based on accounting income instead of cash flows. That's a pretty big problem. You know, that's a difficulty for many people. They're, they're not interested so much in income as they are the cash flows from these projects. It does not consider the time value of money. This is huge. This is really a huge problem. Now, one benefit, it, it does provide some rate of return, a rate of return, but that rate of return is based on accounting income instead of cash flows, and it is not discounted for the time value of money. So, so it's a rate of return, but not one that's very well respected. Reinvestment rate, not applicable because we're not talking about reinvesting over time. It does not consider the time value of money. And with respect to the ability to rank projects, you can compare the simple rate of return from one project to the other. And so that's that's the, the green light it's got. That's the green light it's got. The other thing I might say, too, is this, this accounting income measure can be beneficial to look at when we're looking at a business operation that is heavily scrutinized using financial accounting. So it does have that redeeming quality. So there you have it, everybody, a, a look at capital budgeting. I really thank you for tuning in and watching the video. And if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. I really would appreciate that. So this is Mike Werner from Miami saying bye for now, and I'll see you in the next video.